Thank you for joining Direct Women's webinar on a view from, from first-time corporate board directors. My name is Kelsey Velma, and I'll be your technical moderator behind the scenes. I'm the Director of Programs and Operations here at Direct Women, and I'm excited to be hosting today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping notes. You should all be able to see the screen right now and hear my voice. The phone lines, however, are muted, so although all of you can hear me, we cannot hear you. That said, you can still ask questions and we encourage you to do so. At the top right of your screen is the GoToWebinar panel. Just open the console, find the questions section, type your question and hit submit. Feel free to submit questions at any time during today's program. Today's webinar will be approximately one hour with 45 minutes of content followed by a few minutes for audience Q&A. Our speakers' biographies are available for download in the handout section of the GoToWebinar console. Lastly, there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar that we hope you will complete. It's only four questions and should take no more than two to three minutes tops. With that, I would like to turn it over to the moderator of today's program, Katherine biggs Arrowwood. Katherine? Thank you, Kelsey, I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is gonna be a great panel discussion and I hope you'll learn a lot from us. We've got some very seasoned people that have a lot of good advice to give you. Um, I'm, uh, had the privilege of being the chair of Direct Women and had been involved in it for the last 10 or well, almost the whole time it's been in existence, the last 15 years. And for those of you who don't know, a Direct Women was a spinoff of the ADA business law section about 15 years ago. And its mission is to get as many women lawyers as we can on public boards of directors. Um, it's hard to think about what things were like 15 years ago, but we continue to have a lot of success uh, reaching our mission. Uh, we um, include uh, identifying qualified women who would be suitable for boards. We put on programs to help women with their board journey. And we have, as a result, created a very strong pipeline of women attorneys for corporate boards such that we get called on now by companies seeking these qualified candidates. So it's been a great journey for 15 years and we're glad that all of y'all are interested in what we do. So now with that, let me introduce our panel members. Uh, Priscilla uh, Alm Almodovar, who is Wave, if you will, so that you can see who you are on the screen. Um, she is president and CEO of Enterprise Community Partners and is a 2008 alumna of the Direct Women Board Institute, which you'll probably hear some more about as we talk today. She is currently a director on the board of Realty Income Corporation, which I believe just went through an acquisition or merger, which we'll probably hear about. And she chairs uh, or serves on the audit committee for that company. Uh, next, we have uh, Kim Cheney. Kim, give a shout out. Thank you. We were talking about before we started out grandmas and uh, the AME church and her family reunion. She's got a very interesting uh, background. Um, but she is uh, currently the vice executive vice president, chief legal officer, and corporate secretary at Aptar Group and is a member of the 2002 Direct Win Women Board Institute. So she's going through the institute now. Um, she is currently a director on the board of Neo Photonics Corporation, where she serves on the compensation, nominating, and governance committees. And last but not least, we have Juliet Pryor, who is with us today from Dallas. She is executive vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary at Albertsons Companies, Inc., and a 2018 alumni of our Direct Women Board Institute. She is currently a director on the board of Genuine Parts Company, where she serves on the audit committee. Uh, I'm just thrilled to have all three of them here on this panel. Now, before we get started with our discussion, I thought I would give you uh, in the audience uh, a sort of a brief overview of the topics we're gonna try to cover. Uh, these include uh, how to narrow your board search, activating your network, um, how to frame your value proposition, what about board interviews, how to handle those, and evaluation of the opportunities that may be presented to you. Uh, we'll also try to touch on the experiences uh, each of our panelists have had during their first year on their boards, and then conclude with the question and answer session as Kelsey mentioned. And so I encourage you to put your questions with regard to these topics into the chat as the program goes along. 
we will swing back to Kelsey at the end and she will uh, help us uh, uh, get your questions and uh, so that we can discuss them. So now with all that background information, let's get to the matter at hand. Uh, I want, would like to start by getting each of our panelists uh, to give a brief description of how you landed your first board seat. So let's start with Priscilla, if we could. All right, thank you, Catherine. It's so great to be here. So I landed my my board position, I guess a very traditional way, it was through a, a very good friend who was a colleague who became a friend who sits on three boards and an opportunity came up uh, with a, a real estate investment trust and she called and that's how it happened for me. Well, you just walked right into it, which is a pretty good thing. Uh, Tim, how about you? Um, I was actually, um, I was actually recruited to my first board by a search firm. I had let my, uh, I call it a year and a half ago, I attended a seminar put on by direct women. Uh, I had been invited by one of the law firms, and I will call them out, Squire Patton Boggs. They uh, sent me the invite, said attend this this actual seminar. And part of that discussion was uh, alert your network. So I told um, as many people as I could, including uh, someone I knew at a search firm, yeah, I'd like to go on a board. I want to do a public company, technology company. Um, understanding that it was a, um, it's about your network and I didn't have one of folks on boards, but that search firm no more than about two months later called and said, we have an opportunity that you should take a look at. And it was a small public company uh, technology firm um, that creates the lasers for connected devices. And I was super excited by connected devices. It was a good conversation. I ended up on the board. Great. Juliet, how about you? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me, Catherine. Good to be with everybody. Uh, so not too dissimilar to what Kimberly and Priscilla share. But, you know, I went through the Direct Women Board Institute 2018, and I'm sure we'll talk more about lessons learned through that process. But I, I went through that institute, and that was sort of the marker for me of, okay, I'm now I'm gonna be really focused on getting, getting onto a board. I wound up going on a board um, at the beginning of 2020, so it, it took a little bit of time. Um, what I had done between 2018 and 2020 was, all the things we'll dig into around activating my network and getting my elevator speech. And I'd done, you know, interviews for a couple of boards and all these types of things. But the board that they actually wound up uh, joining, Genuine Parts, I got a reach out on LinkedIn from a recruiter from, from a very small recruiting shop that I'd never heard of, that wasn't a recruiter that does recruiting in the legal space that I almost ignored. And I, 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 I was someone you didn't know, excuse me, I didn't know. reach out um, on. And, and what it was is they had done a search for specific experiences that were in my background and in my bio and some of the key phrases hit. And it was a Juliet, I wonder if you'd be interested in talking. And I'm sure we get all kinds of reach outs in our LinkedIn messaging. And I don't know what it is that maybe decided to just sort of respond um, and, and, and I did, and we got into a conversation and then I discovered that it was something that I really did have business connections to that it made sense. Cause I start with why me, why are you calling? Um, and that's how I wound up on that board, but it was definitely a place I might have ignored. That's a great story. <laughs> it really is. It's remarkable. Um, Kim, would you talk a little bit about how you narrowed the companies and types of industries you wanted to look at? Um, absolutely. I, based on the the conversations that I'd been having, it, it would have been traditional for me to go into something that's very close to what I do in my day job, which is large Fortune 500 or large Fortune um, 1000 companies in the manufacturing, industrial, specialty chemical space, and that's where a lot of folks were um, advising me to look. But my passion is around technology and connected devices and helping industry make that pivot. So since it was, call it a long shot, I, was, I anticipated that my board search process could take two, three, 10 years. I asked for what I really wanted, which was tech. And that's how that conversation took place. But it was a conversation that I had with um, my CEO as a sitting general counsel, I only get one board. So 
making sure that no one was surprised that this was where I was going to focus my efforts and reaching out and talking with people to say, does this sound um, appropriate for someone at my level and um, the role I have? That's how I narrowed my search. And Priscilla, maybe you could talk a little bit about what you specifically were looking for in for, for the kind of company that you wanted to serve on. Yeah, so um, I'll take that question and add on to the first one, um, if I may. So sure. I guess it took me 14 years to get on the board. Um, I, I was in the, it was direct woman who put the idea of me possibly serving on a board into my head. I was a corporate partner at White and Case and didn't see myself in that capacity. And it was this program that just opened my mind to that. Now that was 14 years ago, but that kernel, they planted the seed. So congratulations to New York women, because again, 14 years ago at the very start, you planted the seed in someone like me as a new corporate partner that I could one day be a board member. So I guess throughout the years, you know, we all work really hard. Um, I guess I was activating my network. At the time, we didn't have those words, but now we have words for that. Without knowing it, I was activating my network. And one was this colleague who, again, became a friend, banker, who I'd mentioned I'd one day like to serve on a board and occasionally would talk to her about that process. I would say this, for the first board, based on my experience, um, it's less about being selective, if you will. Um, you're, at least, I think if I serve on a second board, I would be in the buyer seat. From my first board, I felt as if I was the one selling um, why I would be a good board member as, a boat, as opposed to the company selling me as to why they want me on the board. So I do think, at least from my experience, and I had the good fortune of having a friend whom I respect, at least it was in my industry. So real estate, it, they do a different type of real estate. I'm in affordable housing. So I had to connect the dots for the board why I would make a good board member from a substantive perspective but also I had to make the case, and I, I hope we'll get into this. What are those first questions that you all got? I'd love to hear from you, Kimberly and Gillette. What, what questions you got early on to make the case why you would make a good board member? So the short answer is, I really just fell into my lap. My friend knew I was in real estate. This happened to be a real estate board. We had talked about it over the years and she thought about me. That's I would great. be a lot more selective the second time. <laughs> Julia, how about you? How did you go about well, one thing I want to just sort of highlight, it goes back to a comment that, that Kim made about um, she decided to focus on where she had her passion, even though it might have been a, a longer short shot or a harder, you know, horizon to, to achieve. And when I first said to my CEO um, that I was um, pursuing a board seat, because I changed jobs two years ago. So when I was recruited to Albertsons, I said, by the way, I've started searching for a board seat. Um, if you want me to put this on hold for a year, I can, but I really, I wanna do it. And he said, no, you you should do it, you, should, you know? And he kept saying, just be selective. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking the way that, you know, Priscilla was describing, like, I've not been on a board before, so how selective can I be? But I but I do think it's 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 a great point, even if it's your first, to be, to be thoughtful and, and to really curate what makes sense. Now, one of the things that I had clarity about for myself beyond sort of industry and where what I can contribute was that I was hoping that I would not wind up in a boardroom that was way too active, right? <laughs> I didn't wanna go on a board and the next day they had a shareholder activist and I'm trying to do my day job. I, I, I wanted to ease into juggling my my day job and my first board seat and i've been very fortunate with that um it you know when i was meeting the directors they, they you know they were you know they had a lot of defined and mature processes a mature organization um so that i i could wade in and 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 test the waters comfortably that doesn't always happen for people um uh, but that was that was um attractive to me when i was having the conversations um, with both the recruiter and then with the directors going through the process. Um, so it's it's really being realistic about what what you can handle on your plate. Uh, and, and I do think even if it's your first time, what you think you can meaningfully contribute uh, as as a director. Um, Kim, did you in your board search 
and I want to kind of shift to the activate your network topic now. Um, but did you use the network to help you uh, understand what might happen at the company whose board you were, were considering? You know, to, to Juliet's point about a shareholder activist situation arising or, you know, bankruptcy on the horizon or heavens to Betsy, who knows what. Uh, how, did, how did you gather that information? No, uh, the network, my network was absolutely key in helping me do my due diligence process. Um, what is this company? What is the technology? What are the, um, what's going on in their industry? Um, the company I was on the board of was in the midst, was looking for someone with strong global regulatory experience. I was interested in them because of technology. They were interested in my global regulatory experience because one of their large customers had been caught in the first wave of China-based sanctions. And so they were making a pivot to a new industry. Um, and I happened to have worked for a lot of different types of user groups. So I brought that, I brought the global regulatory background and having my network explain to me where the risks were, what the value I could bring to the table was important. And it also helped, you know, lawyers can be risk averse. And so understanding where the risks are, um, how um, strong boards handle them. And when you see those mature processes in place at your company that you're looking at, it um, makes you feel comfortable that it's something that you want to do because having a day job, sitting in the C-suite as a sitting uh, very new public company GC, you wanted to make sure that you were doing um, all things with excellence. So, so I, Kathy, absolutely. Sorry, Heather, may I share a story? Sure, please do. So if life were perfect, we would do the diligence, because I do think as a first time board member, you do have to be careful. I think we're so many women and new board members are so eager to be on a board that they might fail to do their diligence. Well, I did my due diligence, notwithstanding that I had a good friend on the board. Guess what? And, and by the way, it was, a, it was a company who had gone through an incredible journey regulatory issue, had solved the regulatory issue. I read all the press releases, the proxies. I'm like, this is a board, Gillette, to your comment. <laughs> they have their act together, amazing CEO, the board very strong. This is my first time for your reason. I'm gonna, I'll contribute hopefully and learn a lot. Well, guess what? Two months later, they got they got a, they were became a target. Um, it was, for, fortunately, it was a friendly transaction. They were approached, so they were at the time about eleven billion dollar enterprise value company. And I share that only again. I'm not an expert, but I will. This is just one word of caution. I would say, just based on my very one uh, my one experience, if the company is of a certain size, given the amount of capital that's out there, it might be acquired. And you have no say in that. So I'm a new board member, two months in, and this whole process goes on. Um, I have to say, in hindsight, it was a great process because, again, it was friendly. It wasn't an activist investor. Um, but it was still, you have to drop what you're doing. And as a board member, and I have a day job, too. So I think before you sign up for a board, it's you can't go in thinking that it's just four board meetings a year, some committee meetings. You do have to be prepared that if the company needs you because there's an issue that goes on, in my case, it was this acquisition, um, you need to make the time. So I do think you have to go in eyes wide open. Um, fortunately, the company was acquired. It's now a $55 billion company. I was one of the two board members invited on. So I'm hoping that the one I'm on now is too big to be acquired, but who knows? You, you re Things happen, you know, mm. things happen. So I, I do think you have to go in eyes wide open. Yeah. I just wanted to share you. that true story. No. No, and Priscilla, I'm right there with you. My company was acquired. Um, they are at the end of, um, call it their regulatory approvals. So give it some time for all of the, the regulators around the globe to sign off. And, you know, then this company will be part of someone else's company. So uh, absolutely, with the amount of capital out there in the marketplace, you have to be aware of that as a board member, that everything can be quiet and mature and perfect until the day that it's not. Until it's not. <laughs> and what I would add to that is that's why I think it was so important that I wanted to have the support of my CEO that I was doing this, uh, because if something does blow up, he understands what it means that I'm a director of a public company. And if something happens and I say, you know, I, I really have to step out and be involved in this, 
it's it's understood um, the role that he's agreed that I can take on to add to my plate. Those are great comments. Uh, Ju uh, Priscilla, you were talking about um, having to sell yourself, you know, particularly in the first board situation. Um, and that really comes under the topic of framing your value proposition. We, you know, we've come up with these great terms now for what process, the different stages of this process. Would you talk a little bit about how you sold yourself, if you will, for this, for your board? Yeah, and I think it's such a key, uh, if there's one thing that we you take away from this webinar is that to be able to answer Catherine's question. So even though, because I, I had to go through the process twice, I was interviewed by the first board and then by the second board. And we, you have to have a clear case why, even though you haven't served on a public board, why your experiences, why you believe will make you a good board member. So in my case, I talked about, I've worked in complex organizations. I was a partner at Wine Case, a global law firm. I was at JP Morgan, how I had to navigate complexity. I talked about risk. So at JP Morgan and as lawyers, we are risk managers full stop. So I, without, with lawyers, you have to be annoying to make sure you don't, you have to balance not being too lawyerly, but just, just that risk orientation. So I've run businesses. So from an operating risk, reputation, or it's just that orientation. Um, and then again, the, in my case, while I didn't know their real estate, I was in real estate. So while it's a different kind of real estate, I had the language. Again, I don't think that's the required part. I just happened to have that for this board. But, and then I think the other thing, I, I talked a little bit about my ability to navigate amongst different just different holders and different parties. So I think what they're looking for is to make sure that you're someone that they can see as a fellow colleague. Because the board what I'm now seeing is, the board is really a body of people and you act as one. So I think in both cases, um, once I'd made that case why I thought with confidence, but not arrogance, why I think I could be a good board member, they really wanted to get to know me as well. And I think part of that is now in hindsight, they want to make sure you're someone when things do happen that you're someone that they could have that conversation with. Juliet, how about you? How did you talk to the recruiters in your scenario about your suitability for that board? Yeah. Um, I, I want to piggyback on the last comment that Priscilla made, then I'll go right into your question, Catherine, which is um, when you're uh, having the conversations and uh, they're trying to figure out if they can see you as a colleague. I think that's important for people who are seeking board seats. Are these people you wanna spend time with? Mm -hmm. Like don't want a board seat so bad <laughs> that you would take a seat and you don't really have rapport or you don't really like the current directors that you're meeting. I mean, you have to spend a lot of time deliberating with these people and so even though it's your first, I, you know, I, it keeps ringing uh, in my head, my, my CEO's reminder, you know, be selective, you know, <laughs> even though it's your first, but still be selective. But uh, with regard to how I um, framed describing uh, what I would bring to the table, I was uh, pretty focused on um, not emphasizing my, my lawyer status, right? Uh, they already have a general counsel. And, and that's not why I'm, I'm coming into the role. And I wanted to really uh, emphasize my business leadership and my commercial uh, experience more broadly, um, having been a part of C-suite teams. And, um, you know, I, I really tried to navigate. And, and I know that in some of the interviews, some directors asked me about questions that were clearly because I was a lawyer and I kept trying to pull it back into um, having been through business transformations and major, major mergers and challenges of, you know, macroeconomics and how the business navigates and just really trying to talk about other things that I, that I had walked through my career without having sort of blinders on of just the law so that they would see me as a potential member of that board who would contribute in a, in a broader sense. And I think that's something that that uh, lawyer candidates have to be thoughtful about. So, so Julie, if I may, Catherine, just that, Julie, great point. Um, similar with me, I talked about being a CEO and my executive. What I would say for lawyers, because it's such a great point, 
you almost have to undo the lawyer stuff. That was my impression. And what's great is if you're a partner at a law firm, you are part of a large enterprise. You're part of a large, it's a business. So talk about it as what your firm has done. And if you're in-house, you manage a team, right? So such a great, I think that is such a great, how you tell your story, mm -hmm. it's so critical. Such a great point. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. These, these are very important points to, to be made. Um, and before I want to let Kim comment on the same thing, but Juliet, I'm curious, uh, on the topic of board interviews, tell us a little bit about who interviewed you and was there one interview or were there multiple interviews or how did that work for you? Uh, so I should add that I joined this board in um, February of 21. So in the pandemic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And okay. so I did a fair amount of interviews like this virtually. And then the last couple of meetings, uh, we ultimately agreed, you know, to do a careful in-person uh, set of meetings. But yeah, you know, that that that's that was part of that process. Um, so I, I met the board chair, the board vice chair, um, the head of the uh, NomGov committee, uh, the CEO. Um, the CFO, I think that's probably the universe. Um, I figured out that I knew somebody on that board. So I was able to sort of have other conversations to, because I want to understand culture, you know, how, do, how does the board deal with decision-making, conflict, those kinds of things. And so um, that was um, a place for me to sort of tap into, I think, Kim was speaking earlier about using your network to understand the company and those kinds of things. And that was that was a plus for me to be able to get that insight. The COVID notwithstanding, it sounds like you really were able to get a pretty good handle on what to expect. Yes, but it was definitely, I, I kept going like, I'm doing these, inter like we're not gonna meet. <laughs> it was, <laughs> seems like a big deal. <laughs> yeah, in my family, it's always, you need to go break bread with them. To yes, yes. <laughs> get, get into business with somebody unless you've broken bread can, can get yes. an idea that kind of thing. Well, um, Kim, how about you in terms of board interviews and, and also how you sold yourself in those interviews? Um, part of my conversation, or let's, let, we'll go backwards. Um, <laughs> I did all the things that Priscilla and Juliet mentioned around asking questions because I had thought about it ahead of time, it was really a conversation of what are you looking for? What am I looking for? They weren't looking for technical expertise. They had some of the best people in tech. They were looking for regulatory. So we talked about regulatory. I was looking for exposure for cutting edge tech. And they said, we've got that uh, for in spades. So that was a wonderful part of the discussion, but it was a conversation. Um, also, the conversation was really about meeting some of the other board members. I met mainly the CEO, CFO, folks on the NomGov committee, and the chair of audit committee. I also asked to speak to one other director in particular, who was the first woman to be on the board of this organization, to ask her. Uh, she also had a really cool job in another technology connected cars, which I love. So having those conversations of how does the board interact? How do they treat each other? Um, really brought home that I liked the people I was talking to. It, they were folks I could spend time with. I think the average director, um, notwithstanding my experience, the average director tenure might be six, eight, 10 years. For those of us who've been practicing 20 years or less, the idea of spending the next half of my career or what has been the half of my career with the folks that I'm meeting on Zoom is daunting. And so really having that discussion of do I like these folks because <laughs> um, the best and the worst will come out in times of crisis. And if you don't like them now, you were definitely not going to like them then. So <laughs> be, you can get through a lot of things around industry and but if you don't like the people, that's that's not going to be any fun, and it's a long time. Priscilla, what um, questions did you ask during your board interview? Comment on the propriety of cross-examining, if you will. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great it's a great question. So one of the questions I asked is, what's the culture of the board? 
because I wanted to hear from them. Um, so that was a very open-ended question. Um, I, I asked about, uh, again, I had read their proxy, so I, there were some things I was able to glean, again, high level. Um, we talked about ESG a lot and how they're navigating those issues. So again, it was more, my, my first of all, I had to meet, every, I met, for one of the boards, I met every board member. That's interesting that you, that you all did not. The second one, it was NomGov CEO um, and a couple of others. Um, we talked, you know, ESG was a topic that came up because again, that's something that every and it was more. There was no, it was an open-ended conversation. So how are you all dealing with ESG issues? How are you thinking about it? That was a good question. We talked about um, the topic. I asked them how they keep up to date with the industry, again, open-ended, actually got a lot of good kernels of, uh, you know, there's so much information that we could all read as board members, just to know what's going on from a corporate governance perspective. So that was another open-ended question. And then I asked about the, the engagement with the CEO. So these were all, my point is they were open-ended questions, mm -hmm. but it demonstrated an orientation to someone who understood the difference between governance versus being on the management team and interviewing for a job, it's, if that makes sense. Those are the ones that come to mind. But the culture one was a, is a very good question to ask them and to hear their responses and how they, I also did mine on Zoom to see their reactions um, as they're answering that question. Well, we're gonna talk about your first experiences in your new boards in just a minute, but I wanted to go back to Kim because when we were talking earlier, you mentioned something that Vernon Jordan said to you, which I just thought was in his book rather, which I thought was just a great point about anyone who's joining a board for the first time. What was that? Um, boards are a group of equals. So there is no hierarchy and everybody sits around the table and they should have equal voices around the table. But Vernon Jordan talks in his book, um, he mentioned that at his first board meeting, he wasn't sure what to do. So he did what his mother told him, which was to do what everyone else did. And they sat down at the table, opened up their folio, took the check out of the left-hand side and put it in their lapel jacket. Obviously it was all men, um, put it in their lapel jacket and then started the meeting. And as a new board member um, going into a completely different world, and it is very different, learning the rules of how boards interact with each other as equals has been illuminating. Uh, the one example I have is the optional board dinner is not optional. That was, that was, <laughs> yeah. And um, these are the, there's the informal parts. And I think that's why it's easier to get your second board than your first one mm -hmm. is because everyone understands that you understand this informal rules and culture surrounding uh, membership on a board. And that's what has been, I won't call it a learning curve, but it's something that you're, I'm paying a lot of attention to details and asking either in my head, why do we do it this way? Or calling someone else and saying, why do we do it this way? So it's important. <laughs> now your board is in, Cal your company's in, in California, right? It is, it is. And we is have that been, go ahead. Was it was that a factor in your evaluation of whether you wanted to be on this company board? Uh, it was. I wanted to be in Silicon Valley. So it is right. It is 30 years in Silicon Valley, one of the originals. So I wanted to be there in the center of the U.S. tech world. But it means, you know, I come out of um, it means that getting there is involves me clearing my schedule, letting my CEO know where they are because we have been in person almost all the way through the pandemic. I also joined during the pandemic, but we've been in person for most of those meetings. And it is, um, you. the scheduling is important. Juliet, how about you? Are you, do you have to take into account travel? With <laughs> it's it's funny. Um, <laughs> it's funny because um, I, I work for Albertsons, which is headquartered in Boise, Idaho. So a few, I, I, I think most of my documents, you'll see Boise, Idaho. That's my official work location. My last job was in Atlanta. I still live in Atlanta. And this company is headquartered in Atlanta. 
so, so far it's been um it's been pretty good in terms of the commuting to the board meetings um before the um, pandemic one meeting a year would be in one of the one of it's a global company in one of the locations outside of the united states but that hasn't happened um this past you know year and a half so we'll see we'll see what happens uh, going forward but so far it's been we've been in person and it's been easy to navigate that part thus far yeah priscilla as i recall didn't you say that you had private conversations with each of your board members and to talk a little bit about how you or got yourself oriented to the board you were on it yeah so um so i too was onboarded i interviewed and onboarded during covid and you know i've been told you have to build relationships with each board member so what i did because again they were so, so friendly i called every single board member one-on-one -on -one and found 30 minutes to visit with them just to get to know them and uh, we're having our first we're meeting in person in may and I, I think it just you know i've now have met them once but it was at the time i hadn't and i, I think made when i did meet them made a big difference and i i initiated that reach out um and i am glad i did and they want to help a new board member you're now part of their team so yeah. Um, Did they have a board orient a formal orientation for you, sort of separate? Yeah. Yes. So uh, they did. Then that was in person. Um, it was like a three hour or so orientation with the CFO, the major business heads. And honestly, um, I look forward to doing that again or some form of that once you're on the board for a while because they're throwing so much information at you. Again, you should all have read their proxy, their annual reports and other filings, but now you're getting into how they operate and manage their business. I look forward to having similar conversations once I'm on the board a bit longer. But yes, a good board should onboard you and, and do a formal onboarding. Juliet, how about you? Was there a formal? Yeah, no, I, I did not have a formal um, onboarding. Um, so what, what, I, what I was able to get was, um, a very very order organized set of onboarding materials and the you know we can have a call about it but what actually happened that was most helpful my second meeting had already been scheduled to be a two-day offsite for the board on a deep dive on on the strategy and and it was like such a gift <laughs> yeah, that's great. and you know board members who'd been on the board for years were like i learned more in this meeting than i have in years and i'm like wow and i'm brand new <laughs> so that's how you know just the timing just worked out perfectly and it was it was actually their first time doing it and it wound up being you know my second meeting and two days of just deep deep into into all the topics around the industry you know industry experts presented business leaders it was just really great wow Kimberly, talk about your onboarding a little bit, if you will. Um, my onboarding was a formal conversation as well as documents with each of the major business unit heads, um, as well as conversations with various board members. So it was, you know, very, it's an engineering company, very formal uh, process. And it really grounded me in the, here are the key issues that the company is dealing with and um, where board members could provide um, advice and counsel. So it was very formal and it was similar to processes that I'd um, supporting boards that I'd put together. So it was, it was familiar. The one thing I would say is for those who are thinking about a public company board to the extent they have interactions with their existing board, that's one other conversation point that will come up in your board interviews. If you've not served on a board, um, have you had interactions with them so that you have a sense of the difference between management and oversight? And so that's something that people should keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Or at least if they're early in their board journey, make sure that they're having the conversation with their senior management to make sure they get those experience. It may only be once or twice in their career, but they should ask. Yeah. Or somebody want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, another great point. Um, so back to the narratives of my story, it's all coming back to me, is that comment, Kim, about if you have any exposure to boards, generally work that into your narrative. So in my case, I said, well, I haven't been on a public board. As a lawyer and as a banker, I've been in front of the board room and I've advised board members. So it sounds like you were with a public company, so you could say something differently, but there's a way to work in 
uh, that you've been exposed to boards, have interacted with board members, I think that's key. Now, I had the good fortune of having done that as a lawyer and as a, as a banker. If you don't have that, if you sit on a, a large nonprofit, for example, like find a way to bring in, you know, some interactions about being on a board, I think is helpful. But a public board would be even the best, but great point. Agree. Well, um, since y'all, tell me Priscilla, how long you have been on the your board? Well, you have two boards, so collectively. <laughs> both experiences how long have you served now on that board uh so the current one now uh when i was acquired since november of 2021 okay but well, actually sorry it's COVID is a blur it's, awesome. it's so <laughs> hard to know what year it is isn't what it, year it is? so we're in, no it must be before then it must be no i'm sorry november 2020 because we met in may so no sorry november 2020 i've been on this board Sorry, it is a blur. Okay, so there's- We've only met once. I've only met physically with them once because of COVID. So kind of looking back on, uh, given that you've been on the board that long and looking back on the interview process and the like, is there anything about how you approach things that you would change or do differently? So I would say that if, if I knew that I wanted to be on a board, I said direct women came early into my life in 2008. That was probably a little bit early. If I had to do anything differently, it's staying in touch with an organization like a direct women and do their programming and stay current on what boards are talking about. Because when an opportunity does come up, like in my case, my friend called or a recruiter calls you, you're pretty up to speed on what is, what's what's happening in the boardroom generally. So again, it worked out for me, but I had to do a lot of catching up because I confess I had, I had now I, I do have a board, so I guess I, I have a sense of it. One thing I, I think also that I will continue to do and I recommend is, especially if you're a litigator, is read the Wall Street Journal, read the Financial Times. So fortunately, you want to be, regardless of what industry your board is, is in, your company's in, as a board member, you should know what's going on macro, macroly, not just about your company, but if it's a consumer company, if it's an international company, um, it's almost an obligation. So I was fortunate that I, I read the FT and have since I've been a young associate. Um, I wish I had stayed in touch more with direct women and your programming. Um, there are other ways to do that. So that's what I would do differently. I mean, it worked out, but I could have been better prepared to act on it when I got that opportunity. Well, we're glad we're reconnected with you now. So, <laughs> uh, Kim, how about you? Have you got any sort of words of wisdom for folks? I, what you, some things you might have done differently? I think I agree with what Priscilla um, mentioned. I would have done. I might have applied for direct women earlier in my career, mm -hmm. as opposed to after being on a board. I would mm -hmm. recommend that if you're serious about this, you'd start working on your board bio. Uh, Direct Women does publish all the board bios online. It is not fun um, sitting there on a Saturday <laughs> night, pulling down all the Direct Women bios, trying to figure out what you're supposed what to put in your own, which is what I did. And I and I won't tell you whose bio I, uh, um, the which ones I had on the table um, highlighting, um, because there were folks with similar types of experiences that helped me um, describe but I don't know why they described it that way. So that's why I'm going through the class now. So that's the kind of thing that would be helpful to do ahead of time is to be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. You're gonna need a board bio, your LinkedIn should be updated, you should have your talking points. And you can do that without the program, but the program I'm sure will make it a lot more, it will make it better. But that's the one thing I would tell you is get started on that board bio now. Kim, I was asked, um, they asked me for my board bio. I had no idea what a board bio is. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> of course, I had my friend, like, what's a board bio? And sure enough, there's a, there's like a, there's a one right answer, but it's one page, it's high level. And I had it created. I wish I'd had it prepared. So when, you know, to be, again, just be more prepared. Yeah. It's great. Direct Women did not do that in 2008. So it sounds like the program has just evolved because you do need that. We've yeah. gotten better and better every year. That is exactly right. And and it, the looking at the success rate of our 
alumni getting on board. So it's the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Juliet, what about you? What we we got to go to some questions here in a minute, but what about your lessons learned? Uh, question here. Uh, I, I I think it is. Um, just talking to more people, being very open about the about the aspiration. Um, you know, it worked out well that that I wound up on this board, but there are, you know, there are relationships. I've I've been a public company GC more than once. There's no reason that I couldn't tell every director that I interacted with that that was, you know, an aspiration of mine, and just you know kept kindled, you know, kept warm all of those con conversations and relationships. Um, because that may come up for a subsequent board, even though I'll be someone who has a, you know, a public company board experience, it, it still is good. So it, it's about, I think I started with it sort of, um, absolutely direct women talks about activating your network. And I learned a lot through that process. Um, I think the biggest aha for me in learning about activating the network was direct women said, yeah, you can reach out to that person you haven't talked to in 10 years. I'm like, what? That would be impossible. They were like, no, you can. Here's how you do it. And I, I would Men never do it have done all the it. time. Men do that all the time. I, I I probably kind of know it, but it was it took the institute to make me say, put that person down, even though it's been a decade, make the call. Um, and so while I, you know, activated my network. I think there were more people that I could just be casually mentioning, you know, one of the things I'm trying to work on. Uh, and I try to be more intentional about that generally. Yeah. Being intentional is the word I've heard so many of our alumni talk talk about. Uh, they get their bios straightened, straightened out and then they sit down and create a list of the people in their network that they think might be helpful and develop a timeline. And so like, Every two weeks, they're making a phone call or sending an email to somebody saying, oh, by the way, here I am. Um, and I, it, it, it's very interesting being very intentional and not letting it slip. Yes. Uh, yeah. Things to be pretty effective. Um, and as can. you look at a board, they will call those folks anyway. Right. <laughs> when the question came up, we're going to call someone you worked for, you know, 15 years ago. And they did, mm -hmm. or sometimes they just call ahead of time, even before they meet you. And if people remember you fondly, that that is that's what they're looking for. It's not how good you were as a lawyer. It's do you like them? Um, and so having that list prepared and thought about ahead of time is helpful. Yeah, Kim, I was asked for references from one of the boards too. Yeah. So be prepared and think about who they are. Yeah. And even if you have references, they will tell you, no, 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 we know these people who yeah. are on your LinkedIn, we're going to call them, yeah. <laughs> or they are did. I was just like, yeah. okay. <laughs> Not lose track, the circle back to LinkedIn, which helped, helped you guys. Um, you know, that is another area, the people who are your contacts on LinkedIn, you, you make a very good point, Kim, they, they can be called. Um, so LinkedIn is a great way to renew some of those acquaintances. Is, is doing a message through LinkedIn to some of some of those folks because you're already connected with them. You just haven't communicated directly with them in a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can more easily provide that direct communication. Well, I hate to stop this. This is a great discussion, but I think I need to find our there there you are, my dear. Come come on and tell us what questions we have. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Um, we have quite a few questions, so hopefully we'll be able to get to a few here in the next couple of minutes. Um, so we received a, a handful of questions, all kind of circling around nonprofit board service. So um, one of them is, does, does long service on a nonprofit board um, support your readiness for a public board? We had someone ask um, if you know what the pros and cons are of serving on a nonprofit board versus a public board as your first experience and then also if the panelists would speak to you know is all nonprofit board service created equally uh, in a really small nonprofit versus something huge Can we start with Priscilla because I see her nodding her yes. head <laughs> yes so I would say it's not all this is my personal view um, first of all, nonprofit is just a tax status. So there are large 501c3s that are just as uh, 
comp complicated, have similar governance issues, they have government contracts, lots of huge funding, they're in the multi-million dollar range. So if you serve on a nonprofit that fits that mold, absolutely you should talk about it and talk about the board. I would miss my advice, I wouldn't use very a small nonprofit because that might diminish your, even though you yourself might be very involved with the organization and, and spend a lot of time, you almost need like a wow factor of that nonprofit. So be prepared if you do use, what I'll say is this, if you do use a nonprofit, you should know their operating budget, right? Because they will ask you. They'll ask you that if you're opening, you better know the answer, right? They'll say, how large is the operating budget? Who else is on the board? So it does have to be the, you have to be strategic of which nonprofit you use. Are you on the audit committee? So who's the auditor? That's another question. If you're going to mention a nonprofit, know its operating budget, know the auditor, who the auditor is, and maybe if there's a, a name you can drop of a fellow board member. So that's my bias. It's not every uh, nonprofit board. Not to diminish the service on a nonprofit, but I think some nonprofit boards like AARP, I mean, there's some really large ones that you should mention. I don't know, what do others think? I think it's a really fair point. Um, and I and I like the the push for people to have some of those stats at their at their fingertips. So you know I, I serve on a couple of non not nonprofit boards, but one of them is a national nonprofit, right, with some um, notable names on that board. So that's one I would speak to, mm -hmm. and um, others I I probably wouldn't mention. I love the work. Uh, mm -hmm. But and, and and sometimes I think, you know, there are things that we do that we don't get credit for for our next opportunity. I know that those things have still helped me um, mm -hmm. to grow as a leader and they're, they're getting the benefit of it, but it wasn't what attracted them to the conversation with me. So I do think that you have to be thoughtful about um, what you share and it has to have something um, significant. And it's about does the governance of that not-for-profit approximate in some ways what it would mean uh, in a for-profit uh, organization uh, on their board. That, that's the reason that the, we're making this distinction, I think. And I would I would echo all that's been said. I have a couple nonprofit boards which are personally fulfilling to me, but they are not the very large arts institution I serve on or served on where most of the other board members were sitting CEOs or private equity or investment bankers. Two different types of conversations and and again, governance of the organization. So one was definitely, again, love arts organizations, but it also brought with it a different type of board than some of my smaller passion projects that are more social services oriented. There's a difference. And Kim, you mentioned the one thing about uh, nonprofits is it is frequently a place where you will meet a CEO or a nom and gov committee chair of some big company uh, who has the same passion you do. Uh, so sometimes it is an opportunity to uh, uh, expand your network uh, that will lead to a board seat. So I'll just add that on. So Kelsey, next question. Thank you. Um, what is the typical time commitment to expect while serving on a corporate board? That's a $60 million question, right? There. <laughs> it all depends. Mm -hmm. I think the rule of thumb is probably something like 10 days, all, you know, 10 days a year. I mean, if you think about four meetings and you think about prep and other stuff in your committee, that's kind of how I, I think about what the, what's the what's the time cost to me on average. Now, something blows up and there's a deal, it can be way more than that. But as a starting point, I think of it that way. Priscilla? Yeah, um, I, I was given a rule of thumb of um, if it's a four hour board meeting, it probably takes four hours to prepare. So it's a, just a rule of thumb. So to your point, Juliet, there's generally four board meetings, there's committee meetings. So, um, you know, that's, I know for me as a new board member, it probably took me longer because I did read, I wanted to read the materials and I'm hoping that as I'm on it longer, it takes less to prepare. I will say to be a good board member, you should read all the, you should read the materials. Um, I, there's one board I'm on, I could tell as a board member, I don't know if they read the materials, that's not a good board member. So, um, the staff takes a long time to prepare materials, we should read them. Yeah. It's more efficient. I think that's about right. Um, if there's a deal or something else happens, it gets intense and the board packets are not small. They can be 
200 mm -hmm. to 600 pages. So you really do need the whole day before to, yeah. to get through and have good questions for the board um, when the board meeting comes up. And this is a question you should definitely ask in your board interview. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. You know, at, when you're talking with the being interviewed by the directors, how much time have, has has it taken for you to mm -hmm. thoroughly to get that information? Kelsey, another? Yes. So I think it was Kim who really mentioned this during uh, during the program, but. Um, someone wants to know if you can expand on the informal rules and how to kind of best discover uh, what those informal rules are. Uh, it's really a lot of talking with other sitting board members. So they will give you their best facts um, and things to worry about. I'm still learning. I'm a year in. Uh, but the big one I've, I've learned is go to the board meeting before You've heard some of them develop individual relationships with folks, understand how to give feedback to management. Um, and those are all the things that you can get in a um, traditional board governance program like Direct Women or NACD or any one of a host of others. I'll throw one out. Um, get in the room for the meeting you know, 15 minutes before, if it's in, get, you know, or if it's online, get in early and have that informal conversation. That's re really important. Don't just sort of book yourself up. Like I can take a call from my other job, but like clear everything and get yeah. in the room early and get into those informal chats. That's part of the rapport building. It's, it's, you really need that. It's important. Don't look at your phone. I mean, these are pretty obvious rules, but if you're a new board member, you have to be fully engaged at the board meeting. I will say this also, and I don't know about you two, as a new board member, you're not expected to talk very much, um, you know, because you don't know very much yet about the company. So um, I don't want to suggest you're just an observer, but in the beginning, I think you are sort of an observer a bit too. So um, I, you know, don't feel obligated that you have to have like something so critical um, to ask at your first board meetings or so. And I want to put the plug for NACD, and I only say that because as a board member, um, so I read the Financial Times, you know, NACD is a great, direct woman would be another, find, find that one resource that just forces you to go on what's going on in the boardroom, and the National Association of Corporate Directors is one of those, there are many others, that's the one that I have chosen, but Again, find that one source that you're going to stick. I read FT Moral Money if you don't read that. So find those things that you're comfortable with. It just keeps you current. Great suggestion. Good point. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I know each of you spoke a little bit to something that you would do differently in your search. Um, but we had a question about for second board searches. How, how will you each approach your next board search differently? Mm -hmm. I will take that one since um, I'm coming towards the end of my first board. Um, uh, when I first started, I was going with passion. Uh, now I'll probably go closer to home in terms of industry and go big. Um, so the idea is I understand I'd like to see what scale looks like. And so working closer to my industrial home of manufacturing, I will make that pivot something that is closer to my day job. So that's the the lesson I had is while I enjoyed the technology and the digital pivot um, for the next one, I'd like to do something closer to home. Uh, I, I think that I would still um, go into the reactivation of um, my network, um, you know, the, 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 the relationships also, the recruiters, all, all of those players, I, I, I think I would say I'm looking for a, a second board and and sort of put, put that out there. And um, I probably would call Kim because I'm really interested in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and I'd say, so who do I need to talk to? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, and, and I'd want it to be different. So people who I've, who I've spoken to who are you know, on, you know, three or four boards and they're really, really different because, you know, if they're too similar, there's potential of, you know, conflicts, et cetera. Um, I love hearing their stories about the, the, the variability of what, what their, 
you know, facing in terms of content and challenge and how it keeps them plugged in in so many aspects of industry. And so I would be looking for something far from MySpace, the opposite of Kim, which is why I'd be calling her, um, and uh, would love to have that kind of an experience. Kelsey, I think we're about getting to the magic. Yeah, I think that, that was the last question we had time for, so I'll pass it back to you, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, let me thank our panelists. Y'all have been absolutely spectacular and are, you know, good examples of, of um, how we can lift up all women, if you will, uh, uh, through our networks. Um, Drake Women now has, I, th I think, about 250 women, more or less, who have gone through the program. And we are, uh, every month, more and more women are getting put on public boards. And we're finding that uh, this, when we get to the second terms are coming up, the women who, who are direct women alums who've been placed on these boards are getting other direct women alums and, and other women in their network on boards. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful repeating, uh, highly valuable, uh, network connection to have. Um, and the point y'all were making about staying in touch with your networks and then thinking about it, reactivating them for the second go round is very, very true. Um, and at the same time, we are also pitching and hoping that uh, when you, you have a vacancy on your board, and I'm talking to the audience here generally, uh, if you sit on a board and you have a vacancy on your board, think about that qualified woman who could fill that board seat and suggest it to your NOM and Gov committee. We've had an awful lot of folks getting placed that way. Um, but let me particularly thank our three panelists. It's been just a delight to get to know all three of you. Uh, we wish y'all well in your second board searches and continued success in your first boards that you've gotten. Um, I really appreciate everyone in the audience for, for chiming in today and being here and your very thoughtful questions. Um, Keep your eye out for other direct women programs. We have webinars that focus on some of these topics that we very generally covered today. Um, and take some time to provide feedback through the survey that you will get. And last but not least, I want to thank our sponsors. We've been flashing up the names here because we are speaking of nonprofits, a nonprofit, a real nonprofit. And much of what we do is done through our volunteers. Um, and we are very dependent on our sponsors and our alumni support network who very generously contribute and let us uh, put on all of these programs. Um, so farewell to you all. I hope you all have a great weekend and take care and I hope to see some of you in the audience in our Direct, direct Women Institute in the years to come. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.